Welcome to BizTech's Conversations. Our guest today is Tansri Dato Ramon Navaratnam, the Chairman Asli Centre of Public Policy Studies. Welcome to the show, Tansri. Oh, good to be here with you. Yeah. Now, Tansri, really, we invited you to have this conversation because of a concern that, and, and this centres around how we reverse our obvious economic and social decline and become a nation that others admire once again. Now, I'm speaking about this in the context of, if you think back to the, the ni late 90s and the, the, the 2000s, where Malaysia was one of the leaders of, it really seen as the, a, a model nation from an economic growth perspective, from a social stability, from a political stability. But all of those have been eroded in the last 10 years. Um, what are your thoughts as to how that has come about, Tansri? I'm afraid to admit that you may be right, although we need more research to back that kind of statement. Um, but from not only the economic, uh, socio-economic, political, racial, religious aspect, taking it holistically, I think we have declined. Today, our beloved country, Malaysia, is less united. Yes, definitely, absolutely. Less cohesive, more polarized. And it has seems to have lost, especially in the last few years, its sense of direction. And uh, we are really drifting now. But your question is, why, yes. if that is true, What is the why? root cause? Frankly, I think it's, I hate to admit it, because it's embarrassing, it's the new economic policy that has gone awry. Okay, and, and, and you were one of the, the, the people who were responsible in I the days to... I was a junior officer, yeah. but directly involved from the Ministry of Finance with the EPU, with Bank Negara and other agencies. But these were the core agencies that drafted the new economic policy and we believed in it. I think Tun Razak had the right ideas. After the trauma of the 1969 riots, when there was so much confusion and utter uncertainty, he came up with this policy and that got people together. No, and I think that was very important, Tansri, and, and, and just from a, from a younger Malaysian perspective as well, if you look at it very objectively, NEP was very important to ensure equalization, or, or basically so that nobody would feel left out. Yeah, it's getting everybody a place under the Malaysian sun, and it, the two prongs, one was the eradication of, or elevation of poverty, regardless of race yes but over time people forgot that phrase and focused more and more on the malay population not even sabah and sarawak yes so yes exactly uh, of course yeah. people tend to forget that, that it's a yeah. it's a broader yeah, issue in know, terms of bumi putra this is why this is another reason for our decline he talked a lot of sabah and sarawak and they don't feel strongly Malaysian. They, I think, originally felt that way in 63, 65 and a few years after that. But they feel they have been let down. Similarly, non malays in Peninsula Malaysia have been let down. And a lot of Malays feel they have been bypassed and that the wealth has gone up and was shared by the, the elitist groups of Malays, Chinese, Indians, and some others. But it's a minority. So that's a distortion, and that causes unhappiness, it causes uh, alienation, it causes uh, a lack of zeal, enthusiasm, it causes the brain drain. Of course, and that's been without a, a, which a, you can't a move big forward. issue. Because if you talk about the brain drain and people feeling disconnected, um, the the, the 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 startling figure was basically that almost one million Singaporeans are actually of Malaysian descent, 
Mm. Um, I think that came up, uh, I think, in the last year or so, which was a, 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 a shocking statistic. Um, well, not so shocking to me, because the original Singapore cabinet was mostly those Mal from Malaysia. Yes, from Malaysia, yes. Uh, from Malaya. So, one of the things also, Tansui, which you, you brought out, which is very uh, uh, relevant today, is the fact that there is a disconnect in terms of, across the races, in terms of people feeling that they have a place and they, 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 they have a pay, place in the economic pie because there has been such a concentration of wealth over, and, and you talk about the last, say, from the, the two, early 2000s onwards, people have gotten, at the top, have gotten richer, but the poor have remained poor, irregardless of ethnicity. In fact, the adage that says the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, applies to Malaysia. Yes. And it's unnecessary because, actually, we are a blessed country. Absolutely. With resources, our multiculturalism, multi-religious uh, society, they are assets. But a lot of their politicians, not all, but too many, regard this as a liability. They want monoculture, mono-race, everything mono, but that within that group, they also want to get what's good for them. And I, I think, and, and this is where I think we miss the key advantages and benefits of Malaysia. So as an investment de destination, and, and that's where for us, uh, we're very concerned about because as an, from an economic standpoint, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, late 90s, in the 2000s and so forth, we were seen in ASEAN second only to Singapore. Today, our neighbours have not only caught up, but countries like Vietnam essentially have passed us by. They are the most, besides Singapore, probably the most favoured investment destination. However, Tan Sri, we just, at uh, BizTech, just did an interview uh, a week ago with the CEO of the German Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. And his comments were quite startling. He said that despite the political instability, and, and, and despite all the other negative issues, Malaysia is ranked 12th in the uh, place of ease of doing business. Now, Germany, on the other hand, is 25th in the ranking. His conclusion, having lived in Malaysia for six years, is this. If, and, and, and this was very clear during his interview. If you took away the bureaucratic inefficiencies and brought freedom of mobility to bring in foreign talent, investors would flock to Malaysia. Now, he brought up the example of immigration being a very sticky point. Now, there's a new initiative by Pakeso, which was just announced uh, this month, where every foreign job, uh, if a company wants to hire a foreigner, basically, and I'm talking about a skilled foreigner, that job has to be advertised on the, on, on the website, My Future Jobs, for 30 days, and Pakeso gets involved in the interview process. Now, if you talk about something that is going to hurt us in terms of foreign direct investment, that's going to hurt us tremendously because people are not going to uh, put up with this sort of thing. They'll just go somewhere else to Vietnam or something which is easy. So that, I think, is one of the reasons why Despite all our advantages, despite, as you said, the wonderful place that we are, we are a low cost of operation, we've got a skilled workforce, yet we are basically sabotaging ourselves. And that's why we're not growing fast enough. You know, I'm not quite sure whether this ease of doing business, the ranking is correct. But even if, if it's correct, it need not tell, it need not imply that we are really competitive, you know, because you can, it's easy to do business, perhaps uh, forms, uh, application get cleared faster, especially if you are a foreign investor. You must draw the line. You talk to domestic investors, they have a problem. Of course. Getting a permit, a license, approval, a contract, a land alienation. Why? Yes, because these are all related to uh, there's a couple of issues. Obviously, there's corruption is an issue, um, lack of issue efficiency within the civil service itself. Uh, obviously, that's another issue as well. There's I would disagree. You know, I think it really is the policy of the politicians. 
what do they want uh, malaysian malaysia uh, malaya, uh, malaya uh, for the malays uh, malaysia without too much sabah sarawak participation in this ketuanship indicates that they must in every way be on top so the locals are discarded foreigners are welcome but then they have problems again of getting the right manpower our education system is a cause of a lot of problems yes and that is a, a achilles heel that has been identified yeah. we uh, the lack of english education is going to hurt us long term because oh, science and technology as well we've been talking about it for a long time i remember having a balance better balance i think 60% science technology 40% the liberal arts but it has been the other way it is all screwed up yeah because one of the things is moving forward also all the jobs and even in this downturn that there are a lot of jobs available but they are in tech jobs they are tech pe- because companies and are we don't have that kind of and we don't have enough people correct yeah. now the, ha- critics would argue especially in government that we are doing well enough because suddenly and the latest statistics tell us our universities have climbed up the the global uh, qs uh, university rankings so that kind of skews the picture of the fact that even we don't even participate in the pisa for pisa scoring because that we is the key. are very low that is the key pisa you don't want good universities but so few compared to the rest in the end what about the bulk of the population yes which really has to draw our employment field which has to draw on the service side on the not not a tertiary type of education and that and pisa scores are low in fact so the the education is part of i think a, a fundamental reason why perhaps economically we are not moving forward because in, in we have gaps in the in the skill set uh, but coming back tan sri to terms of economic growth and and what you talked about in terms of of uh, focusing only on ethnic ethnically rather than growing the pie oh, i think critics would say that the smarter thing to do is to grow rather than focusing on cutting the pie uh, uh, the cake a little bit differently it probably be smarter to to have policies to grow the cake so everyone has money in their pockets and then there is less divisiveness within society this is what they say growth with equity you can have both goals achieved grow the economy at the same time distribute now the shared prosperity which they is uh, posing as a uh, goal under the, the next plan five year plan i think that is worthy of pursuit if again is done well the nep was a good policy but got abused got skewed yes so this shared prosperity could be a good thing if we push for growth open up liberalize don't have all these uh, constraints on uh, of nep and rich biased investment give preference to those who can perform and go on merit rather than mediocrity you will move but when these companies do well have a reasonable taxation and distribute it properly the salary scales are low now poverty is rising we can address those issues and go again for better technical vocational tvet kind of education and that's what the germans have done and exactly in fact that is a that is a big weakness in our education system so if you look at the german system as you correctly pointed out they start their apprenticeships as young as 15 and 16 and they acquire skills at various companies so industry basically trains these people they are market ready they are useful in terms of the job market why Our, can't we do that we've been talking about it so long yes but fundamentally we have a problem because our tvet and education is institution based not no. based on uh, uh 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 basically uh, uh placing these employees 
simple. in that's a employment. Simple matter. Yes, so uh, actually, Tansri is not as simple as that because fundamentally you've got to change the way you think about the education. One way, uh, immediate way of doing something. You see, uh, this problem has been accumulating 40, 50 years. Yes. We could have done something earlier, yes. like we said we'd do. But the salary structure. You know, when I was in civil service, the best paid are the liberal arts graduates. We started off on a higher salary than others. I see. And engineers and all that. That was the administrative cadre, the MCS, Malaysian Civil Service, the old uh, British officers when we took over. Now, that got to be revised. But you don't have that incentive. Who would want to be a good technician? No, of course. And, 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 and I think that, that if, if you talk about incentivizing from a global salary perspective, this is one of the things that is stopping us. If we don't have, the argument is, and this is where a lot of employers, uh, SMEs in particular, uh, fall into the trap where it's about throwing factor inputs into a problem rather than looking at productivity. So this is why we are caught in that middle income trap because essentially all we do is bring in cheap foreign labor, throw factor inputs into the production process rather than thinking about how we the increase productivity to do more Indeed, with less. What you are really saying is we don't have a long-term structural view of where we should be going. Yes. That's why we are looking at gaji today, tomorrow, allowance, all that. We are not talking about the whole structure of the economy. And, and, and that's what must come out in the five-year plan. No, and also, Tansri, one of the things is, the, the, the five-year plan is one of the issues. Even in this budget, there isn't... You know, Tony Fernandez had an interesting thing. He, was, you know, uh, he keeps mentioning this, never waste a crisis. And this crisis is actually a great opportunity to do a reset. But if you look at our budget, there's no reset. It's kind of the same business as usual. More pump priming, yeah. yeah. Pump priming. Let's have some high-speed rail projects and and uh, you but know, 15 you, billion. You know of, why? Yeah. You know why? <laughs> because the government of the day is not strong enough to take tough decisions. Yes. Like for example, to modify the NEP, make it more relevant to all, make it more fair. But I think and politically sure. now, they because the government that. is, they don't have the strength to do that, so That's they can't. The, the other thing that they've also neglected to do is, which is probably fiscally quite irresponsible, is uh, what they've proposed to do with the EPF and allow people to withdraw up to 10,000 ringgit out of their EPF accounts. Now, what that's fundamentally doing is hurting basically kicking the can down the road and hurting future governments because people will have that's underfunded pensions. True. But when you have someone who is an EPF uh, contributor and he can't put bread on the table, he can't have his just simple meal for his family, what do you do? Tell but him, look, save, never mind, count, be satisfied, counting your money like Silas Mana and uh, let the children stop. No, Tan uh, Tansri. Yeah. So here's the thing. The, the taking money out progressively is something that I think most of us agree to. Taking money out as a lump sum, because financial literacy is quite poor in Malaysia, you will find that it's very easy to spend that 10000 but very hard to put that back in the account. Well, what do you do? You can reduce it if you like. But this is semantics. This is a question of technicalities. But also but it's the a issue is... In, when in need, provide it. Be careful that you don't over-provide. And under, understand that, again, it's a structural problem. There should have been a good welfare scheme in the country. So this is... That's it comes, lacking. It, it comes so back COVID to, again, as a social... It exposed us to all these weaknesses. Correct. And I hope we learn from these lessons. So... That is my message. So, and, and Tansri then... Yes, we, we, the lack of a safety net for us is a very big issue. But one of the things from a fiscal responsibility, the government should be, and governments all around the world are doing this, instead of getting EPF to be the, or individual's EPF to be the multiplier effect, which is essentially what it's going to be in 2021, as those $10,000 ringgit uh, uh, withdrawals are made, that's going to be a tremendous multiplier you on the economy. A point again. It, it, uh, 
is superficial in a way, if I may say. I see a lot of our problems because the structure is weak. Yes. And structure meaning, why is the public sector so big? You say the civil service is inefficient. Is it recruitment on based on meritocracy? Yeah. No, it's my not. My time, I think it was when you had 4 to 1 ratio. But now... Now um, it's a vote bank. So, so, how do you expect the civil service to be efficient? Because you provide for it not to be efficient. And when it's not efficient, and you put in more and more rules and regulations, then you encourage corruption. Then job for the boys, money yes. to be spread around. So you must hit at the core of the problem, rather than look at it superficially. So I don't think we are able to do it because of weak leadership, uh, lack of will, because it's uh, you will be fair to all, and then some people may say, look, I still want to enjoy my privileged position. And so it goes on to be a continuous argument, and then nothing is settled. And others, as you pointed out earlier, uh, they are moving ahead, because they don't have these constraints. So we are fighting a battle on the world scene with the one hand tied behind our back. So I'm not surprised. Anything happens today, I say, well, to be expected. And that's a bad attitude, because it means we are losing hope. And I yes. think we are. I think the average population... And, and so, Tansri, to sum up our discussion, your final thoughts, Tansri? My final thought is, I hope they didn't do it well enough in the budget. Because I've been involved in drafting budgets for a long time, when I was in government, in the Treasury. But I never came across a speech which emphasized race, or highlighted race. Unfortunately, they did it wrongly, and gives the impression that the Chinese get to what? 100, 177, 177 million, yeah. 177 million, Indians 100 million. But that's not true. The budget is for all. These are special allocations. But for education, for health, for transport, everybody enjoys it. And if you allocate accordingly, it will be much more equitable, rather than to give the impression that for Malay, uh, the rest of the budget, and non Malays only the 100 and the 170. So that, that is the wrong thinking in the government and in the civil service. I hope for the five-year plan, they will do something more substantial, which is do away with the new economic policy or keep it and apply it to all regardless of race. And just look at it on a needs basis. On needs basis and merit basis. I mean, why would you want to help a Malay who is not up to the mark? Help a Malay, another Malay who is really good. But this preference distorts everything. And so that's one message. The most important message, you have to restructure the economy. Go back to basics and make this a more liberal, competitive and fairer society. Stop. Everything will move forward. Thank you very much for your insights, Tan Sri. We've been speaking to Tan Sri Dato Ramon Navaratnam, Chairman of ASLI's Centre of Public Policy Studies. I'm Brian Fernandez for BizTech Conversations. Go to www.biztech.com.